sci-fi concepts and we turn them into reality. Most of our stuff actually comes from movie ideas. Minority Report's the one that we always get associated with. Before I started the ARB lab, I was building laboratories for Ryerson University. And one of the cornerstone pieces we had built for the university was called a cave. And a cave is an immersive room that's four, five, or six walls of displays. And it allows you to go inside of virtual objects. The automotive industry uses it when they're building a car and they'll have an office in Germany, in the US, or anywhere else in the world, and multiple engineers are able to work on the same design virtually. So all three locations have the same virtual car and they're collaborating in the same space together. The university saw value in helping me build a startup and helping get my technology out there to the world. I was trying to design a gesture system that would be able to predict gestures of people before they happened which was very dependent on getting a lot of uh, data collected, which becomes very expensive. You're paying people to contribute to this database. I realized that if I released an Xbox game for the Xbox Connect, I could get my software up to this new level that no one had ever thought of. And the idea was that we'd release a game called Charades, and you get a word or a phrase, and then as you did those gestures in your living room, you'd get converted into an avatar. And it would take that avatar, send it through the network, then friends, teammates, groups of people would have to guess the gestures you're making uh, while you did them in real time. And they would guess not by pressing buttons or clicking things, they would guess by yelling out the answer. And if they got the answer right, they get points, and they get points based on how fast they answered the question, which was really great for us because the best samples and the best answers would be region coded to a specific area and then sent back to our servers and we designed an artificial intelligence that could learn only gestures. And it would learn these gestures and we'd be able to take these and sell them to the oil industry, security companies like airports, casinos, banks, so they could identify aggressive gestures in public places. We were the first company to monetize the sale of gestures, which seems kind of like a, an abstract idea, it's like selling emotions, but it worked for us. And our software could recognize a gesture at around 600 frames per second, so 20 times faster than the human eye could see. It gets it off of one frame. That's enough for us to be able to figure out what gesture you're making. In boxing, the way software works today is you'd have a threshold, and when you went past that threshold, it didn't really matter how you went past that threshold, but the software would say you did a punch, and in a video game, it would fool you into thinking that the system was really accurate, and you'd get the sense of immersion. Our software doesn't work that way. Our software can tell based on how you're, let's say, positioning your weight even, if you're going to make a punch. So in the case of a punch, your ankle twists or you shift your weight into your ankle right before you punch. Our software sees that right away, as well as any other subtlety of your body, and right away can identify that you're gonna make an aggressive gesture or punch. So not only could our software be used to identify these aggressive gestures, but they could be used to make gesture recognition way more realistic and way more immersive. When we start adding things like body language to the communication process, it's how we're physically expressing ourselves that the idea gets conveyed. We think the next gen is going to be a virtual version of that, so a virtual marketplace. There'll be some way that you can interact with virtual devices in the home. Let's say an artist designs a lamp. You'll be able to, to take this lamp, throw it into your environment, and it's not physically there. It's not a solid object, but it still gives off the same light and the same use that a lamp is in an environment, but in a virtual way. So virtual people will become more plausible inside your environment. Children could play with virtual toys like UFOs or flying vehicles that don't have to abide by the same laws of physics because they're virtual, but when you're done with it, you just save it, delete it, archive it, whatever. It's a new form of recycling because you never had to consume the matter to make the object. We know that's coming, and the idea of like a holodeck from Star Trek inside your home or inside your work or you know wherever you are is very plausible now. In the Toronto condominium market, we designed a piece of software that you could either overlay a window or overlay a wall. And if you had a terrible view in your basement apartment, we could give you a better view. You could have a view of Paris even if you're not in France. And the view is not static like a painting or a picture. As you're walking around it, it's readjusting your perspective to make it look like you're actually looking through that window. It could be any type of display. In our case, we invented the world's only frameless interactive display. It's a display that has no physical border around it in glass. I'm the original founder. I have programmers all around the world, developers around the world. That's changing right now. Having people commit for nine to five jobs now is so 
it feels like a century old, but the idea of being able to build teams virtually now and even work on a 24 hour shift sometimes where you've got people on one end of the world finishing up code, you hand it off to the other side of the world, they do the next gen when these guys wake up, they're already a day ahead. I've been in the computer industry since I was a little kid. I didn't grow up too privileged, but my dad was able to get me computers on loans. They were usually the most cutting edge thing from Japan at the time. And a lot of time I'd be able to, you know, disassemble it, reassemble it, and it became very addictive. I feel like we live in the future. When I describe the future, I feel like I'm already in it. A lot of the things you see in Hollywood films, we're the ones trying to make that technology viable today and making those business models work today. I was a huge procrastinator and I was not a particularly successful person for most of my life. Every time I had a responsibility to do, I would say, you know what, I'll do it tomorrow. And the reality was that tomorrow never came because I would spend tomorrow doing yesterday's work. So I always felt like I was locked in the past. If I do tomorrow's work today, I'm technically living in the future right away.